Hello everyone, welcome to the CHS 2020 virtual travelogue. We're going to be talking to you today about some of the amazing herpetofauna that we encountered on a recent trip we took to Indonesia. I'm Julia Riley and I'm a postdoc at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia and I study reptile amphibian ecology, behavior and conservation. And I'm Dr. James Baxter Gilbert, so I'm a postdoc at Stellenbosch University. Uh, most of my work kind of centers at looking at reptiles and amphibians and the impacts of urbanization or invasions. Some of you may know us well from previous Canadian herp meetings and herp research in Canada in general, uh, but for those of you that don't, we just wanted to start off with a brief introduction of ourselves. First off, we're giant herp nerds. We are lucky enough to be able to study reptiles and amphibians for work, so that means a lot of time in the field for us, which is probably my favorite part of the job. Mm -hmm. And also, in our spare time, we often like to go on herp trips, whether that be to Snake Road in Illinois or down to Florida with scales, um, just to herp in our spare time as well. So Julia and I met while we were doing our master's at Laurentian University. Julia was studying with Dr. Jackie Litskis, and I was co-supervised by Dr. Litskis as well as Dr. David Lesbert. So we, so we used to work in this little office here, a little concrete box with no windows. Great place to get a lot of productivity done. We even got married in a little cabin in the woods right here. As young herpetologists, we readily consumed herpetological reviews as soon as they came uh, to our house, as well as watched nature documentaries and uh, was inspired by other biologists' adventures around the world. Uh, we are total dorks, and so we actually even made a list of herps that we wanted to find all around the world. Um, one of my dream lizards to see was the Komodo dragon, the largest lizard in the world. Um, James especially wanted to see an inland taipan, mm -hmm. and I really wanted to see shinglebacks um, in Australia. Um, and although when we made this list, it was really just a dream, um, we've actually been able to uh, check some of the species off this list, and we're going to tell you a story about uh, one of those species uh, today. When we were making the list, we had no idea what was ahead of us, but shortly after finishing our master's at, at Laurentian, Julia got the opportunity to do her PhD at Macquarie University in Australia. So we left Canada, flew overseas, and met who would become both of our PhD supervisors, Martin Whiting. Since leaving our home in Canada, our journey included living in Australia, where we both became doctors, and now we live in South Africa, where we're pursuing our postdoctoral research. The adventure we're sharing with you today happened at the end of our time in Australia, right before we moved to South Africa. So this trip became a herpcation to find Komodo dragons. Here we can see Indonesia, so Australia is just below it, so you can see to, to the bottom right. And then uh, within Indonesia, the park itself is kind of right in the middle. So here you can see where the park is in respect to the rest of the country. Komodo National Park was established specifically to protect the Komodo dragon. Here you can see the historical range of the Komodo dragon. Um, the orange represents where they have been lost from since 1970, and the red represents where they still are. And really the hot spot you can see is encircled by this green line, which is the boundaries for Komodo National Park. This park consists of a series of islands as well as the waters around it. And it's been declared as a UNESCO World Heritage Site due to the amazing endemic wildlife, both on land and under the water that it protects. It is largely a dry savanna vegetation, which is unlike a lot of the rest of Indonesia, although there are few cloud rainforests above 500 meters above sea level. There's also amazing coral reefs and a lot of amazing marine life that you can see there too. In planning this trip, we wanted to undertake it with a couple of dear friends. So we reached out to, to Dr. Joanne Ocock, who's an environmental scientist in Australia. Also, just an amazing wetland e ecologist and frog guru. Um, we also asked Christian Prez Martinez, who was studying in Australia at the time and actually living in, in our house with us. Um, Christian had just finished his his uh, his undergrad at, at Harvard and was working in, in the lab to do some work on frill neck lizards. Um, 
it, a lot of the really amazing photography that came out of this uh, is Christian. So if you want to either check out the amazing work of Joe of Joe's, uh, check out her website, which is just on the bottom left, or the blogs, Twitter, or Instagram of Christian, um, which are all just a stunning wildlife photography. But you'll be seeing a lot of these faces um, of these amazing folks as we go through today's trip. The fifth person on our Herp team was a Jesus Ziz. Now, beyond being just an absolutely wonderful guy, Ajiz is one of the park rangers at Komodo National Park. He also runs wildlife tours in the region, specifically focused on herp de fauna. So without a doubt, he is one of the local experts on where to find amazing herps. So much so that when documentaries get filmed in the region, he's typically the guy that they call. So when we were planning this trip, a couple of people had put us in contact with Ajiz, and he was able to not only help us find all the wonderful wildlife we're about to show you, but he planned and organized the trip he, he got us boated from place to place. He made sure we were fed and happy and healthy. Uh, he is, I can't stop singing his praises. He's such a nice guy. The plan we laid out on our trip was to spend two days after we arrived on Flores, which is the main island near Komodo National Park. We would then travel by boat to Komodo Island and spend two and a half days herping on Komodo Island. After that, we would spend half a day and one night herping Padar, which is a small island between Komodo and Rincha, which are the two main islands in the park. And then we would go and finish our trip up on Rincha Island. After that, we would go back to Flores and fly out after eight days of herping and just overall fun in the sun. I think I mentioned before that I'm pretty nerdy and one of my favorite parts of preparing for a trip is buying field guides, looking through them, and finding out what's in store. When we were preparing for this trip, the field guides that we had didn't really cover Indonesia very thoroughly and they weren't very specific to the Komodo National Parks region at all. So being the giant herp nerds that we were, when in doubt, make your own field guide. So we started off uh, by base, by building it from uh, uh, the 1980 report by Offenberger and then just digging into as much literature as we could find. I even reached out to Mark O'Shea to ask him if he was aware of any obscured or old or, 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 or cryptic books or, or, or field guides that might have existed that we couldn't find. And he was uh, kind enough to send a massive reading list that kept us quite busy. Making a field guide for our trip made it obvious what a biodiverse place Komodo National Park is. Not only does it have the largest lizard in the world, but it also has a suite of other lizard species on the islands. There are also a lot of frogs and an amazing diversity of snakes too. In the water around the islands, there are sea turtles and even saltwater crocodiles. However, if you're planning a trip to Komodo, uh, you don't need to go through this activity yourself. The year after we went, they came out with this publication, The Amphibians and Reptiles of Komodo National Park. Um, you can actually see that Ajiz is the second author on, uh, on the guide, which is super cool. Um, but these are, are, are available for free online, um, although you can donate if, 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 if you, you would like to, but you can download the guide itself as, as a PDF or this wonderful poster. So although making a few guides is a lot of fun, um, if you're planning a trip specifically here, you might not need to go through that activity. So with our friends in tow and our field guides in hand, we hopped on a plane and headed to Flores. So after landing in Le Buon Boisjo, we picked up some local treats, including salak, which is also known as snake fruit. It's a type of uh, tasty little palm fruit. And we headed off on our adventure. So we made our way down to the docks hopped a boat out to our hotel, so you can see that on, on the right, which consisted of a series of little tree houses built into the side of this hill. Soon after we arrived at our tree houses, we found our first herp of the trip, which was of course a little brown skink. This is a Flores banded skink, and they actually uh, were something we encountered throughout our trip um, in Komodo National Park. and. They were absolutely everywhere. They were scurrying all the time at a high abundance throughout the undergrowth, and they were just amazing to see um, hanging around at all times. 
Herping around ho hotels can be tricky. However, spending some time in, in the tropics almost anywhere in the world, you realize that if you just wait until nightfall, something amazing happens. Because this is when all the geckos come out, and luckily Indonesia has a ton of awesome gecko species. The first gecko we found that evening was the flat-tailed gecko. This gecko is about medium-sized, and you can find it on the ceilings of the hotel, the walls, and also in natural habitats throughout the, the islands that we went to. Key ID features of this gecko is that it has a flattened fringe all around the its tail, as well as along the back of its hind legs and uh, really densely webbed feet. Another species that we saw were Demandville's bent-toed geckos. So this is a, a somewhat larger species. Um, they're fairly terrestrial, although you, you can find them climbing on stuff as, uh, as well. Um, they're common on all of the islands, um, and, and we saw adults and juveniles, all sorts of, of sizes. Most notably, they have this really cool kind of textured rugus skin, um, but they are super, super cute. You can't go anywhere in the world that's warm without encountering some common house geckos. So these were frequent, mostly around human hab habitation, but every now and then you'd catch them out in the bush as well. We also found common dwarf geckos. These were very, very small geckos in comparison to the others that we have talked about. And there were also ones that were quite arboreal. We didn't actually see these ones as much. And also there was a lot of discussion regarding uh, how to identify these geckos, especially when there was such a diversity of them around. Needless to say, the need for a field guide came in, especially when trying to ID the little gecko species apart. One gecko we didn't need a field guide to ID, and one of my absolute favorite geckos in the world, uh, it was also hanging around our hotel, the Toke gecko. These geckos were very common throughout all of the islands, uh, and they could be found in human habitats as well as in natural areas, often calling out loudly at night. The next morning, after a solid night of geckoing, we got up bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and went back into Le Buon Boisjo to visit one of the local parks on Flores that has a bat cave. The gif on the left shows you what traveling on Flores by road kind of looks like. So as you're going down the road, every now and then, you'll just catch a glimpse of a water buffalo on the roadside. Now these are people's kind of d domestic or, 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 or personal cows, but they'll often have a ring or a rope tied through their nose. So anytime we were going through wet spots, we would often kind of quickly crank our heads and try to spot one of these bovids sitting on the side of the road. But what this allowed us to do was find the first varanid of our trip. So sitting in a wet spot, not being a water buffalo, was an Asian water monitor. And this lovely chap was sitting out basking on, on, on a rock. And we had, to, we had to actually call to the cab driver and shout like, there's a lizard, there's a lizard, there's a lizard. And once he figured out how excited he, we were, he, uh, he slammed up the brakes on and we were able to kind of back up and get a good look at this gorgeous devil. After leaving our monitor friend behind, we got into the park and started our, our hike. Now Flores has kind of weather somewhat more typical of Indonesia as a whole. So you can start a hike in the lovely uh, warm sun, but quickly some blow in off the uh, seas and you'll be hiking through um, some pretty wet and sloppy terrain. Um, this makes for <laughs> a bit of an enjoyable hike on a hot day, but it does leave your clothes pretty swampy. Luckily, swampiness is something that amphibians absolutely love, and it allowed us to start finding some really cool frogs. So one of the first frogs that we came across was this crab-eating frog. So these guys were in little ponds, and this species is very common throughout a lot of Southeast Asia. You can tell that it's the crab-eating frog because of its skin folds that occur across all of its back, and it also has this really long pointed snout. We also were lucky to find this little cutie. This is a Javanese bullfrog, and it's a typical chubby frog that has some light modeling on its back, and you can see it, the quintessential round shape. 
After a brief hike, we made it to the Batcave, which did not disappoint. So you can see the top right picture of this kind of amazing cluster of fruit bats. And within the cave was also amblet pigeons and all sorts of other cool creatures. If you look at the bottom left, you can actually see the massive pile of guano ahead of our guide. He's the chap in the red hat. But this is decades and decades and decades of built up bat poo. So it was really fun to kind of scamper around and see some of this amazing critters. As we left the bat cave, we got caught in another series of... Lucky for us, there was this little cafe in the middle of the jungle, which allowed us to stop and have a cup of coffee in between bouts of rain. Along our hike, we also took in the other amazing uh, animals that were in the area. We saw beautiful orioles, fish eagles, as well as amazing invertebrates like the forest scorpion. And we also saw this totally ginormous earthworm that was brought out by the rains. At the end of the hike, we came across one other herp species. This is one of the two snake-eyed skinks that are found in the region. This one is absolutely beautiful with black and yellow stripes all along its back. This is a very small skink, only about less than 10 centimeters in snout vent length. And they are so small that they live under barks and trees or cracks in houses. Getting back to the hotel after our long wet hike, we were greeted by another toke gecko on the roof and went about the process of hanging our clothes to dry. This vignette kind of became an ongoing theme of spending a day hiking and either soaking your clothes in rain or sweat and then hanging them to dry that night. The next day we woke with great anticipation, packed our bags and headed to the beach of our hotel where we were going to meet a G. He took us to our boat and this was our home for the next six days where we traveled through the islands of Komodo National Park. After getting settled on the boat, we set out to sea and headed towards Komodo Island. We were absolutely just enthralled by the landscape around us. This is basically what our trip like looked like for the next uh, week. And we uh, have, were surrounded by sea as well as the beautiful islands that were in Komodo National Park. Our arrival at Komodo Island had our spirits extremely high. With over 1,500 dragons that we could see, we were all freaking out a little bit. As we made our way through the islands, uh, we got a chance to kind of chat with the G's more one-on-one, -on -one, and he laid out his strategy for optimizing how many herps we can find in a short period of time. So what this involved was an early morning rise, a quick breakfast, and a morning hike. Um, then come back, eat some lunch, go out for a snorkel, have a snack, an evening hike, dinner, and then a night hike. So the idea was to maximize the time that we could be on the island when herptofauna was the most active. Once we arrived, we disembarked and started walking down the very long dock that leads to Komodo National Park. Where we're greeted by this giant, beautiful archway, and then suddenly the magic starts happening. As soon as you get onto the island, you start seeing Komodo dragons everywhere. This is a series of shops that are really close to the docks. And this is where we saw our first bunch of dragons. The first Komodo dragon that we saw was this sub-adult. He was hanging out on the tarps that are the roofs to the shops. And he was just cheekily exploring the area, maybe looking for a little bite to eat. And then also was meandering around in the trees nearby the shops. He was so inquisitive about what was around him. After we continued on our hike into more natural areas in Komodo, we started to realize that we were surrounded by some really big beasts. It's really, really difficult to articulate how large these lizards actually are. Um, they're also really long lived and they're just amazing to see in the wild. Komodo is a total haven for them. They have this beautiful skin that is covered in osteoderms, which forms sort of a chain mail that protects the adults when they're combating with one another. The abundance of these dragons is outstanding and you just keep seeing more and more of them around every tree or bush or tucked into nooks and 
what's amazing is that they're pretty accustomed to people. You know, the idea that, that uh, cruise ships pull in with thousands of folks that go on on like a, a single conga line hike. So they're not too fussed with you being there, which allows you to get some really kind of up close one-on-one uh, -on -one interactions with these amazing animals. So this is the importance of having a guide. And you actually have to have a guide on Komodo. Uh, it's not like Algonquin Park where you can just wander off into the woods yourself. So there, you need to have a field guide because so things like this can happen. They are just out and they're walking around and they're lumbering and they don't want anything to befell you nor anything bad to happen to the dragons. Not only were the Komodo dragons around us on the ground, they were also up in the trees. Here you can see a beautiful young of the year dragon and something that's very strikingly different about it is its coloration. This yellow and black modeling is really a stark difference to the adult dragons. This young of the year is completely arboreal at this stage because the adults pose a grave threat to the dragons and actually will eat any of the young that they find on the ground. We were really lucky to see this juvenile and it, they're not too common to see when you go to these islands. What is common to, to see is these lumbering giants just taking kind of these crash naps all over the place. And, and so it's not just out in the middle of the forest or out in, in the middle of the savanna, but you can find them in and amongst the, the, the buildings. So you can actually see in, in the background, this is the toilet block and they have this tiny brown wooden door amongst the brickwork. This is a Komodo door. And the reason for it is, is to stop the dragons from going into the bathrooms and taking a nap on the floor. You can imagine if you were running in to take a whiz and suddenly you bumped into a dragon in a small confined room, that would give you one heck of a fright. It is clear from the behavior of these dragons that they absolutely know that they are the top predators of the area, which is completely true. And you just see them lumbering around right beside their prey. You can see in the background of this photo is a Timor deer. And they absolutely just don't care what's going on around them. And they know that they are the kings and queens of this island. With their apex status unquestioned, you're able to really get close and see some, some really cool um, activities and behaviors up close. Initially, there's this feeling that, you know, this is a large predator and that you need to keep your distance and you need to be cautious and careful, but that's what the guides are there for. They're, they're, they're there to make sure that you're safe. This allows you to get a little bit closer and to really get some really neat encounters kind of one-on-one -on -one with these amazing beasts. It's almost kind of comical how close, although respectfully, you can get to these dragons. Here you can see one resting underneath the dock at Komodo Island, and we are all able to kind of get a fun group shot around this dragon. When we come back later on in the evening, though, this dragon was absolutely just passed out on the beach, and we just spent a lot of time taking a close look at it while it was slumbering away in the evening. Speaking of nights, this was one of the real perks to going on this trip with the uh, G's. Due to his connections with the park, he's able to take you onto the island at night, which really opens up the opportunities for finding a lot of different herps, particularly the snakes of the island. Herping at night is always a lot of fun, and this is the best time to find one of the lesser known dragons of Komodo Island. This is a gliding lizard. These are absolutely amazing a gamids. They spend their nights sleeping on branches where they are really camouflaged as you can see in the bottom right photo. But when you pick them up off these branches and they feel like they're going into free fall, they spread their gliding membranes and you're able to actually see the coloration and the, the beautiful membrane that they have exposed when they're gliding from tree to tree. The first snake we encountered on the trip was a common wolf snake. So these are a harmless colubrid that you can frequently find around human habitation, but also particularly at night lurking around trees. One of the reasons for this is they do love eating lizards, which um, luckily for, for them, the abundance of geckos, as well as those gliding lizards, makes uh, these islands a really good habitat for them. One of the other species that we came across 
while herping at night on the island was the lesser Sunda's bronzeback. So these are kind of a long, thin, arboreal snake. Although frequently day active, we did encounter them at night quite a bit. Much like the wolf snake, they're another harmless colubrid that are pretty chill and easy to, to handle. A little surprise that we encountered as we were looking around the trees for snakes was this little banded bullfrog that was tucked into a hollow within a tree. And then we found this beauty. This is a white lip pit viper and it was likely the highlight of our first night on Komodo. This snake comes in three color morphs in the area, this blue form, a green form, and a yellow form. Although this snake is generally widespread, this blue color morph is specific to only a few islands. These snakes are night active, and certainly the ability to go on the island at night really increases your chances of finding them. This isn't to say that they're not active during the day, and you can encounter them depending on how much time you spend hiking. One perk to daytime en encounters is lovely couple shots. However, the excitement is always present when these snakes are around. So obviously the case for herping Komodo at night is quite high, but you can also find some amazing wildlife during the day. With tremendous luck, our first day and our first night, we had already crossed off two of the big herps from our dream list. So we'd seen the Komodos, we'd seen the white-lipped pit vipers. Next on the list was to find a cobra. So Ajiz set us out looking through um, the dry scrub to see what we could find. Here you can see a clear example of the dry savanna habitat that covers most of Komodo Island. Our hikes brought us into the interior of the island. We navigated this dry savanna habitat looking for a cobra but also any other wildlife we could see. It was really amazing to be able to see the contrasting um, habitat from what really I expected as typical of Indonesia. During these hikes, we were able to see a variety of amazing invertebrates and vertebrates, a highlight of which was the lesser sulfur-crested cockatoo, which is a critically endangered bird species that is endemic to this area. Along these hikes, and since we were searching for cobras, we spent a lot of time in habitat like this. So we spent many a kilometer marching up and down the dry riverbeds of the island, which represent this excellent kind of cross-sectioning of edge habitat where snakes could be found. Overall, moving through the interior, you get a really good view of what Komodo looks like, which very much is reminiscent of Jurassic Park. Along the way, we were able to encounter a new species of gecko. This is a morning gecko, as well as a Brahemi blind snake, which is an invasive species that you might be familiar with in North America. While poking along the, the dry riverbeds, we came across this magnificent looking jungle centipede. Yeah, he likes him. Wants to get revenge. That's fair. Yeah. You bump me, I will now bump you. So they're going to eat any other insects? Games do they find? I think they can, they can definitely eat games. Yeah, just whatever they can take down as they find them. Very pretty colors. Yeah, and no, they're voracious. They take down like rodents. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to remember that through all of our hikes, Komodos were always nearby. Even if you can't see a Komodo dragon, you always know they're not far away. Throughout the island, you encounter Komodo poop, which is just full of hair and deer hooves. Also across the island, you can find these nesting mounds. These are created by orange-footed scrub fowl, which are a mound-building bird that's found on the island. Now, the mounds themselves aren't only used by the birds. Um, if you look over the heads of these smiling faces, often in, in the background, you can see a Komodo on top of one of these mounds. Now the Komodos use this to actually dig in their own nests. And so here we can see an, an adult female having a bit of a dig in one of these bird mounds. Uh, we don't know if she was nesting or just having a, a, a peek, but it was really interesting to see. With Komodos abound, 
and not wanting to find ourselves within Komodo poo, it was very important to kind of always keep it in the back of your mind that these amazing animals were always just around the corner. This was typified by one of the encounters that Aji's had while we were looking for cobras. So we had separated and gone our, on our own route with another guide up a riverbed while Aji's went to go check one of his usually snake happy locations. The plan was for him to kind of scout ahead and let us know, um, but we lost track of him for about two hours. And when we actually met up afterwards, he explained that while he was trying to uh, make his way to the riverbed that he wanted to find, a Komodo actually chased him up a tree and, uh, and he had to wait there until it was safe to come down. In the area, it gets really hot in the middle of the day. And so this is when we would take to the sea. There's a lot of opportunities for snorkeling around the Komodo Islands, and we took full advantage of that. Snorkeling in the area, it was amazing to see how clear the water was and also how large corals as well as really health, healthy reefs still exist in the national park. We were able to see a lot of amazing wildlife like starfish, clownfish and anemones, nudibranchs, as well as seahorses even. And so it was really fun to be able to spend the heat of the day cooling off in the oceans around the islands. There were a few key highlights that the snorkeling had to offer. In particular, we were able to snorkel with reef manta rays. It was quite special to be able to snorkel alongside these gentle giants. Ajis brought us to an amazing location called Manta Point where there's a current that is, it has an upwelling of nutrients that comes from the bottom of the ocean and the mantas swim against this current to feed. And if you swim against the current as well, you can um, accompany me them while they're foraging. So what happens is Ajiz will bring the boat a round and, 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 and people on the boat will spot when mantas are cruising up the current. And then you jump off the boat and into the water so you can encounter them. This is a great way to spend an afternoon and certainly one that's full of smiles. The second marine highlight was a location that Ajiz knew called Snake Rock. Now on this rock, you can reliably find yellow lip sea crates, which is just absolutely awesome. We jumped from our boat and snorkeled to the rock and Ajis knew exactly which mangrove to look under to find a whole aggregation of these sea snakes. So sea snakes are notoriously unreliable to find. So the very fact that Ajis had a, 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 a location where you could pull the boat up, jump off the side and find three or four of them stuck on, on under a stump was just awesome. From Snake Rock off of Komodo Island, we headed to Padar. We were riding high after our adventures on Komodo, and it was hard to imagine how it could get much better. A unique highlight of this entire trip was the fact that we actually lived and stayed on the boat. And so really traveling between the islands on this boat, as well as sleeping on it, was such a interesting experience for someone who hasn't spent a lot of time on the sea and also really gave us a feel for the islands and how they're all interconnected. Padar was very interesting to stop at because it's actually not largely a tourist location. There's only a ranger station on the island. It was a haven for skinks, so I really enjoyed this island. We were able to see the dark-throated skink, which is a different species that looks a lot like the Flores banded skink, as well as we found the Flores bar-lipped skink. This is an incredible find, and I really didn't think that we were going to. These guys are a kind of chunky, elongated species that is quite rare to see, and I think this might have been the first time that Ajiz had seen this lizard. We also found the common sun skink, which is a medium-sized lizard, and it was 
very reminiscent of the agurnia that I worked with in Australia. We spent the bulk of the time after arriving on Padar finding these skinks and IDing them. You can see here Ajis is actually using our homemade field guide and uh, running through it with a local ranger on the island. Something that was really exciting was realizing how many skinks were on this island and made us very keen to, for the herping that evening because when there's a lot of skinks, there's often a lot of snakes. As night fell on Padar, we headed back to our boat to refuel and get ready for what we'd hoped to be a very productive herping night. A quick aside and talking about refueling, we have to mention how amazing the food was the whole trip. So whenever we got on the boat, there was always snacks there. Every meal looked just like this. It was delicious and, and amazing and kept us um, well energized for all of the activities that we were undertaking. But after you get a full meal in your stomach, you get your boots back on and get out to the field because when night falls, the snakes come out in full force. Padar was chock full of white lip pit vipers. Here we found a lot of the green morph, which we didn't find as much on Komodo Island. We, there was such a high abundance of snakes here that we found juveniles all the way up to adults. With so many snakes on the island, we got an, an opportunity to see some really natural history interactions. So this is one of the white-lipped pit vipers feeding on one of the dark-throated skinks. Along with the pit vipers, we were able to see our old friend, the bronzebacks, again, up and climbing the trees and looking for lizards. With another night of excellent herping complete, we headed back to the boat to prepare for our next island adventure. From Padar, we headed to Rincha Island. At this point in the trip, all of our spirits were riding high. We had really enjoyed the adventure that we've been on so far. James. Hadn't forgotten, though, the two snakes that he still really wanted to see, the cobra and the Russell's viper. Arriving at Rincha, you quickly notice the habitat's quite different. So around the docks are these beautiful mangroves, and then you start to head into the island through these gorgeous gates. Rincha, much like Komodo Island, was full of dragons. And they aggregate a lot of the time close to the houses that are on the island and you can see the interactions between dragons in these aggregations. You can also see a lot of interactions between the dragons and their prey. Now unlike Komodo Island, Rincha has a large population of water buffalo. And these guys are all over the, the shop and kind of move around in these little roaming gangs. These large animals um, are another kind of feature that you need to keep your eye out for while you're herping around the island. Um, water buffalo in general are a lot more docile than their African counterparts. So, so whereas uh, uh, savannah buffalo made the kind of uh, the, the big five here in Africa for the hazards that they can uh, represent, water buffalo are more or less just a creature that you need to kind of be aware of and keep your eye out for and try not to agitate them too much. This can be a bit tricky, particularly in the long grass when you're herping around and looking for little small skinks that are, that are scampering and then suddenly you bump into a buffalo that's just having a bit of a munch. Another species we saw on Rincha that we didn't see on Komodo were crab-eating macaques. It was quite neat to see these uh, monkeys just 
wandering around the beaches and um, and the forests uh, in their social groups, but also foraging for crabs. Similar to what we did in Komodo, we spent a lot of time in Rincha wandering up and down dry riverbeds. It was about this time in our hike when we stopped to photograph some scrub fowl, when all of a sudden we heard Christian shouting out that he saw a snake and a geez dashed off like lightning to see what it was. This is when we hit pay dirt and we finally found a cobra. So after four days of slogging it up and down dry river beds, we managed to rustle up a Southern Indonesian spitting cobra and it was a treat. Thanks to Jesus' skills handling the cobra and also the fact that the cobra was quite chill, we were able to spend some time interacting and photographing this amazing snake. It was an absolute stunner. Which plastered smiles across our entire group. With the cobra figuratively in the bag, we took back to the trails to see what else we could rustle up on the island. As you hike across Rincha, you notice that a lot of the tree habitats seem centralized in the valleys and a lot of the upland habitats quite grassy and open. Within these little pockets, you get a noticeably cooler climate, uh, and, which can act as a bit of a reservoir for certain species. It was in this forested habitat that we found a herp that we didn't expect to see on our trip. I know everyone was very excited when we found the cobra, but one of the highlights was me for me on this trip was finding this Dunn's Emo skink. This is a very small skink, less than 10 centimeters in snout vent length, and they have this beautiful blue tail, very akin to five line skinks back home in Ontario. These skinks live in the leaf litter on the forest floor, and it's really impossible to find them. And so this was such an incredible encounter and was also Aziz's first time ever seeing this skink. With night approaching on Rincha came our last opportunity to find a Russell's Viper. So we got to it, scouring the island to try our luck one more time. During our night hike, we came across an old friend. You might remember the crab-eating frog from our hike on Flores. On Rincha, we found these frogs scattered across the landscape, repeatedly sitting on top of water buffalo poop. And we were very intrigued by this behavior. So after we came home, we scoured the literature for accounts of this type of behavior and actually wrote up a natural history note and entitled it An Instance of Dunging. With fleeting time left on the island and failing flashlight batteries, we pushed on into the night to try to find that Russell's Viper. Moving along the trail, I almost tripped over a sleeping Komodo, and when I looked up, I found an awake one walking towards me. Not to say that I think I was in any danger, but seeing a Komodo dragon come out of the darkness straight at, at you after almost falling over a, another one is a bit of a heart-stopping moment. Here's a picture of what it looked like when you could actually activate proper lighting, but with my tiny flash flashlight, all I could see was a section of each one. Now from there, we kept going. We had multiple members of the rangers who, who were helping us try to find a snake, and we kind of separated out for a little while. And after, I think, hours of walking the darkness, Julia, myself, Joe, and Christian found ourselves sitting down with the rangers at their station, when all of a sudden, one of the young chaps came running into the light. As the young ranger caught his breath, he was able to tell us that Jesus had spotted a Russell's Viper up past a derelict water tank. So we grabbed our gear and motored up up the hill to get to him and hopefully see this snake. Lucky for us, Ajiz was able to wrangle the Russell's Viper and we were able to take photographs and spend some time with this beautiful While hanging out with it, we were really able to appreciate this snake's beauty, as well as we're able to see its defensive behavior where it kept just filled its body with air and let out the biggest huff I'd ever really heard a viper let out before. It was really amazing to be able to check this uh, snake find off our list. And I have to say that James was pretty 
pretty happy about it. With all of the major herps ticked off our lists, we made our way back from Rinca to Flores. Along the way, we stopped at a fishing village which had a bat cave rumored to be frequented by Timor pythons. After a short hike inland from the village, we came to the cave, and although it was spectacular looking, it sadly didn't have any pythons inside it. Nevertheless, we were very happy herp herpers, and we'd seen a whole smattering of spectacular biodiversity over the eight days of our trip. From there, we made our way back to Flores, boarded a plane, and in short time, we were wings over Indonesia once again. I have to admit that this trip to Komodo National Park was one of my absolute favorite adventures in my entire life. If you are thinking about planning something similar in our post-COVID world, well, the first tip that I would give is to find a solid tour guide. And specifically, I would recommend Ajis. He's very active on Facebook, and it's actually through messaging him on there that we planned our entire trip. I also highly recommend uh, bringing along a solid field guide, especially so you can identify all those tiny little skinks. Um, and you can just download the free one that um, is on, on the internet. Lastly, if you're hoping to find a whole bunch of fascinating herps, it is important that you do not skip leg day ahead of time. Uh, there is a lot of kilometers of dry riverbed which will require hiking. So you'll end up walking like it's Lord of the Rings and you'll end up swimming in the afternoons like it's Finding Nemo. Thanks so much for listening to our Komodo adventure and I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks very, very much. We're happy to answer any questions you have or if later down the road something jumps in into your mind and you want to get a hold of us, you can reach us on Twitter or via email.